Uh, we've been going through a series here at Madison Church called Asking for a Friend, and that series uh, goes to a new chapter today. It uh, has a new page being turned. Um, we've been talking about questions related to human experience, uh, what kinds of things we go through as believers or, or things that we encounter in life and asking questions about what the Bible says about those. And now we're going to spend a few weeks answering questions about the church, about what the church is and what we do here uh, together as a church. And today we're asking the question, what happened to the church in the New Testament? And, and how did we get here to where church is like this for us today? Maybe you have noticed that the church we read about in the, in the gospel, well, in the book of Acts, or the kind of church that you learn about in the New Testament epistles, it, it doesn't sound much like the church of 2023. Even across the world, there, it doesn't seem like that's the, that's the state that the church exists in today. So you're wondering, like, how did we get from that version of Christianity to the kind that, that we take part in here? Maybe you've wondered uh, how we arrived at the place where there are six different kinds of churches in a town of 1,400 people. Why some of them are called Protestant and just one kind of them is not. Why wars have been fought across Europe and elsewhere over which kind of church would be the dominant one in a particular place or country. It would be fitting for us to start with this passage on the screen in Matthew chapter 16. Because as you read through the story of the New Testament, this is the first place where the word church appears. Jesus had come to a point in his ministry with the disciples where they were ready to accept and understand and discuss who he was. And so at the point where Peter is able to say, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus is ready to now tell them what their job is going to be as his disciples. Right? So once they are able to identify, this is really who you are. You really are the Messiah of God, God's Son. Jesus is ready to tell them that he will build his church upon their testimony, upon Peter here, who he's speaking to. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. He tells them that I will give, the, give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, this is the first time that this word church appears in the New Testament. And, and uh, the word here is ekklesia. It means called out ones. It would be a common word in, the, in Greek parlance. Uh, it would be a common word for any assembly of people, like an army called out to fight would be called an ekklesia, or, or a gathering of people just having a, a meeting somewhere in town would be an ekklesia, an assembly. This is the word God uses for, that Jesus uses here to describe what his disciples will create, will be in charge of uh, when he departs from them. He tells them that the kingdom of heaven will be in their hands, right? So Jesus comes announcing the kingdom, following on John the Baptist, saying the kingdom of heaven has come near, and, and Jesus is here to, to do that. Jesus becomes our king when he dies on the cross and raised from the dead and ascends into heaven. And Jesus says, this kingdom is going to be put into your hands, and you guys will, will get to be in charge of this. You guys will get to be my disciples, be my ambassadors to the world. The kingdom will, will live in the world through you, through what you do in the world. The mission of Jesus would be continued by them. And I want to look further into what that mission is for the church this morning. So I'm going to ask you to open with me to Ephesians chapter 3. If you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to spend... Uh, really all our time in the Bible here in Ephesians chapter 3 and into chapter 4. Also, some of the key passages uh, in this text are printed inside your bulletin if you want to look there this morning instead. Here in Ephesians 3 and 4, uh, we are going to read one of the most explicit texts in the Bible about the, what the church is. And we can only answer today's question of how we got here uh, from the New Testament church, if we understand what the church's job is, what our mission and role is. Uh, in Ephesians 3, I'm going to start reading in verse 7. 
So Ephesians 3, starting at verse 7, it says, uh, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, God's plan from the beginning, from the beginning, according to his eternal purpose, before creation, God's plan was to reveal his glory through the church. It's for the darkened and fallen world and the forces which rule over our darkened and fallen world to see and hear God's glory through the testimony of his followers, the church. The church's opponents are the spiritual forces of darkness which have reigned over the world of sin. I know here in, in this text, it just says, uh, made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. If you look back earlier in Ephesians, when Paul says rulers and authorities, he's talking about the rulers and authorities of our darkened world, the evil powers which, which hold mankind in bondage through sin. So we learn here that the church should embody the kingdom of heaven in such a way that it overcomes the wickedness and selfishness and idolatry of the rest of the world. And if you'll skip down to verse 20 with me now in Ephesians chapter 3, you can see the method by which this will be accomplished. So how is it that, that we are uh, going to make known the manifold wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms? Verse 20, uh, this, this is what we're reading the end of Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. And he says this, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. The church, which again is the assembly of God's people, is to bring glory to God throughout all generations forever and ever. That is our job. This is our job as Jesus followers. We give testimony to, to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms by giving glory to God forever and ever. And God's power is at work within us so that we can accomplish that. This mission is at the core of what it means to be the church. The church is the assembly of God's people who bring glory to God. But how do we do that? How does the church bring glory to God in the world? How can we give testimony of the manifold wisdom of God to the powers and authorities in the heavenly realms? Look at chapter 4, verse 1, the very next passage. The apostle Paul says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. We as the church give glory to God by the way that we live our lives. The church's job together, our job together as Madison Church, is to live redeemed lives that are obedient to God, that do not indulge in the wickedness and selfishness of our fallen world, so that our town, our community, our neighbors, our world can see God's glory through us, through the lives that we live in God's spirit. Now, there are a lot of ways that we do this. There are nearly innumerable ways in which the life that we are called to live in righteousness conflicts with the sinfulness of our fallen world, and, and each of them is important. But I want to talk about one specifically today, one that the church has not done particularly well through the ages. This crucial aspect of righteous living that I'm going to bring up that, that would bring glory to God is emphasized in the very next verses of Ephesians 4. So we read verse 1. Let's start back there. In Ephesians 4, verse 1, it says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity 
of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father in all, of all, who is over all and through all and in all. One key, crucial, and essential way. Oh, we're going to switch mics. There's protocol. I'm going to use this one and stop crackling at you. Uh, so one key and crucial and essential way that the church is to bring glory to God in the world is to be one with each other. And like I said, this is something that through the millennia of the church, we've done pretty poorly, especially recently. It would give glory to God if we, in our interactions with each other, with every other believer, were completely humble and gentle and patient, forbearing, with forbearing love and in peace. And when we read Ephesians 4.4, 4, that there is just one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, it means that there is just one church, not six. There was a time when that was more apparent than today. Right? There was a time in the history of the world, in the history of the gospel, in the church, when someone who, who looked at Christianity and Christians around the world could recognize that they were all a part of the same movement, that they were all a part of the same body. But sadly, that is not the case today. I'm going to tell you why. Uh, so I'm about to tell you a, a lot of historical information. I think it's important for me to cite my sources so you know I didn't get this stuff from Wikipedia. I do work a little harder than that. Um, so I use books by James North, uh, who's a professor, professor at Cincinnati, was a professor in Cincinnati, uh, Bruce Shelley at Denver Seminary, and Michael Kruger. Uh, he teaches at uh, Reformed Theological Seminary in North Carolina. I uh, also have personally read a lot of the early Christian literature uh, from the second and third centuries. In the, so this is a focus of mine in my graduate studies. Um, so I read from the collection edited by Roberts and Donaldson and published by Hendrickson Publishers. Dave, I don't know if it's any relation there or not. Um, the Church of the New Testament met in houses across the Mediterranean world. That's, that's how the church got its start, and for the first really several or few hundred years of the church, meeting at houses was the, the normal practice. There was no formal structure or governing body over all the churches across the Roman world or, or across any, any of the world where the gospel reached. But local congregations had elders who led the church. And during the time of the apostles, the apostles had authority uh, to, to spread the gospel in this way, and, and, and they were deferred to as the authority. And, and then uh, as the churches were established, like I said, they had elders who led each congregation. The Greek word for elders in the Bible is presbyteros and episkopos. Uh, whether or not those are interchangeable is uh, a debate that has taken many careers. Um, and... and and they also had deacons who served. In the second century, uh, the church developed a practice of elevating one elder to a special position of leadership over the church, and they were known as the bishop. So there's a little more information about this change in church history. It happened pretty sharply in the second century AD. Uh, so that information is from a historian named Michael Kruger. And for the first several centuries of the church, Christians were a collaborative network of churches across the known world. Most of the early Christian literature that we have access to from the first couple hundred years of the church are bishops of churches writing to other churches. And there was no, like I said, there was no defined authority to structure, so not, no one bishop was in charge, or there wasn't uh, like a, a college of them that, were, uh, that had authority over the rest of the churches. Naturally, the bishops of lar larger cities, such as Alexandria and Athens and Rome, were more prominent because they oversaw extremely large churches in their cities. I think it's important to note that as we look at the way that the New Testament church was organized, that uh, churches would be addressed as a singular body in a city, despite the fact that in a city like Alexandria, 
there would be dozens and dozens of different congregations meeting in different houses, right? And, and so very early in the church, even in the New Testament, we see churches being described as one body, even though they met in several different congregations. So the church doesn't need to meet in the same building or have the same preacher uh, to, to be one. There's, there's a unity in the church that transcends the place that we meet or the building uh, that we call our church. It's important to know that the church does not have to be a singular congregation or all meet in the same room. In this early time period, the church faced persecution and, and it wasn't constant. It was episodic depending on who the Roman emperor was and oftentimes the persecution was regional happening in one place and not another. But also during this time, the church was growing at an incredible rate. The greatest persecution of the church came at the end of the third into the fourth century where the Roman emperors Diocletian and Galerius uh, imposed empire-wide persecutions. So they were the only two emperors that said across the Roman Empire, uh, Christianity was illegal. Uh, they murdered many Christians, destroyed the biblical text wherever they could find it, and, uh, and demolished whatever buildings the Christians were using for worship. So as we get to the fourth century, we have a rapidly growing church. Uh, it's nowhere near a majority. So nowhere near a majority of the Roman Empire in the 4th century was, was Christian, but the church was rapidly growing. And we also have a Roman Empire fighting like mad to suppress it uh, with, with greater intensity. And then into the situation steps the Roman Emperor Constantine, who is a pivotal uh, character in the history of the world, especially in the history of the church. Constantine was in a struggle with his brother Maxentius for control of the Western Empire. Uh, and maybe because of a genuine conversion to faith, or maybe just because of political expediency, Constantine becomes a Christian. He is the first Roman emperor to do so. It is a watershed moment in the history of the world, a Christian Roman emperor. Constantine is victorious, and, and be, he becomes emperor instead of, uh, the, instead of the brother uh, whom, with whom he was battling. And he does a couple things. He ends the empirical persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire. So no one is allowed to persecute Christians across the Roman Empire when Constantine takes power. Uh, he deeds and builds them places to worship. So now instead of meeting in houses, the Christians were given centers of, of worship. They were building churches and e even civic buildings were given to them as places of worship. And Constantine generally promotes the well-being of the church uh, while he is the emperor of Rome. Uh, so without the fetters of persecution, and now with the permission of the Roman Empire, the church's meteoric growth continued to somewhere approaching a majority of the Western world. So now Christian faith really is, towards the end of the 4th century, becoming the majority uh, religious religion within the Roman Empire. And at the end of the 4th century, Emperor Theodosius made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. And so now not only... Uh, was Christianity legal, it was the religion of the Roman Empire itself. Constantine was universally regarded by the Christians of his time as a hero. If you read uh, the, the great church historian Eusebius writing in the 4th century, he speaks of Constantine uh, in ways that sound like Jesus sometimes. He was their rescuer from persecution and there, was really, there were really no believers in the 4th century who did not see this as a fantastic development. But now, in 2023, when we look back at this moment, this is an age where we can see the church take some steps that can fairly be called unfortunate or in error. Because the church now, for the first time, wielded a hefty political power. And the church had power that it hadn't had before. It had status that it hadn't had before. And it had agency in the world over society that it had not had before. And through the centuries from this time, the church has shown that it uses that power in worldly, sinful ways. Ways that embrace the dynamics of earthly, sinful advantage instead of the ways of Christ. In the history of the church, really from this time on, to a degree much more severe than before the 4th century, has taken the worldly power that they possess 
and they have not been, as it says on the screen, completely humble and gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love. It, so it really is a fault of the church through, through the centuries, and we're going to talk more about some of the grave sins of the church and how to process those as believers today, uh, next week. But now, uh, as, as we're walking through history now, with the endorsement of the Roman Empire, the church could induct, conduct official business in public. And the dynamic I mentioned earlier where bishops of large cities were especially important continues to grow in intensity, and this is especially true for the bishop of Rome. Rome was the center of the world at this time, and the bishop of Rome's power grew exponentially after the ascension of Constantine in the 4th century, and eventually we get to the point at the end of the 6th century AD where we see the Roman bishop now being called the Pope. So this is how we get the office of Pope. This is why there is someone we call the Pope uh, residing in, in Rome this, to this day. Uh, and so he, he became an authoritative figure over the other bishops in the church. And that office continued to this day in the Catholic Church. Uh, now I want to say something about the word Catholic. Because when we use that word here now in 2023, we think of a certain kind of church, right? When we say Catholic, we think of the church on Jackson Street, St. Patrick's, right? Uh, but the word Catholic is just transliteration of a Greek word, katholikos. It, it means universal or general. And uh, in, the earliest, in the earlier centuries of the church, uh, to say you went to a Catholic church was to say that you did not go to a heretical church. And uh, so when we talk about like the Catholic church from uh, anywhere from where you can say it started maybe in the, in the 4th or 5th or 6th century AD all the way to the Pres Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, uh, we don't really mean a certain kind of church. We, we mean the Orthodox church. The, any church non-heretical was part of the Catholic church. This is what this word means, general or universal. I would argue that I have a Catholic faith. You, know, you could call me a Catholic. That would be fair if we're using the word in the same way. Uh, because having read extensively from the literature of the Anti-Nicene Church Fathers, I can tell you without hesitancy that the faith I know and practice, the faith we practice here at Madison Church, would be considered orthodox among the earliest believers. So it is a Catholic faith when we use the word that way. Uh, the word Catholic is, is more than just the kind of church that St. Patrick's is. It really means universal or orthodox. And as we move into the Middle Ages, a growing divide arose between the Eastern Church and the Western Church. Christianity, um, well, in 1054, uh, the Eastern and Western Church excommunicate each other. It was a pretty sad development. So that's why we have the Roman Catholic Church in the West, the Eastern Orthodox Church um, from out of Constantinople, Constantinople in the East. And, and then there are two dynamics occurring at once this period. One, the church is doing an incredible job of being missionaries throughout the world. And the faith is spreading across the globe everywhere that that the church can reach, they are bringing the faith with them. And there are incredible stories and testimonies uh, of missionaries going across the world uh, during this time from the church. And two, at the same time, through the middle, what we call the, the dark ages, there's also the, a dynamic of the corruption of worldly power that was introduced in the church when they, when they got power in the fourth century, uh, was wandering into some truly unfortunate outcomes for what the church was doing. Uh, the church was behaving in unchristian ways, unchristlike ways with worldly governments. Uh, they were teaching uh, things regarding redemption and sin that ha have nothing to do with the orthodox faith of the Bible. And uh, they were interacting with society in, in ways that, that does not represent the faith of the Bible. And so this, this corruption was working its way into the church, and, and people were noticing. Uh, as Craig mentioned here, Craig mentioned earlier, talking about the Protestant Reformation, there were people 
trying to reform the church from this time. People like John Wycliffe and John Huss uh, trying to reform the church, but it wasn't happening. It wasn't working. And then on October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed a list of 95 objections to the teaching and practice of the Roman Catholic Church to the door of the Wittenberg Chapel, and the movement known as the Protestant Reformation was off and running. Uh, the reformers rejected the authority of the church, which had manifestly made some sinful and corrupt turns. And they anchored their faith and practice solely on what is found in the scriptures. And so this is the big development of the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. They said, let's break off from the Roman church and try to reset around what the Bible says. Which sounds like a great idea. And indeed, I, I, I count myself as a product of the Reformation. I'm with them in, the, in this endeavor. I want to just do what the Bible says too. But there's a large price to pay for doing this. Not only did the Reformation itself fracture the unity of the church by, by splitting away, but the approach of the Reformation of following the Bible instead of any human authority set the trajectory of 10,000 divisions uh, within the church to come. Because it's really hard to agree on exactly what the Bible says. Maybe you've been experiencing that as we've gone through this series together, and you're thinking it's really hard to agree with what Joel says about the Bible sometimes, like about your dog not going to heaven, for instance. Uh, but within the Protestant movement, there are a number uh, of different denominations. Each time people disagreed in a significant manner, they would start a new church with a new name. And today, there are at least 200 major Protestant denominations and tens of thousands of minor divisions among that number, each with a slightly unique doctrinal statement, a unique creedal allegiance or ecclesiastical structure or practice. That is how we got here. That is why there are six different churches in Brooklyn, Iowa, that is why the Hundred Years War was fought. That is why we know the word Protestant. Because of the developments of the church that resulted from the Protestant Reformation, in which we said, let's just do, reset around what the Bible says, and then not being able to agree with each other for several centuries up until this very day about what the Bible says. In a couple weeks, I'll get the chance to tell you what makes our church unique and our approach to this problem, which I think is, is wonderful. But for now, I want to return to the church's mission. Because we're supposed to give testimony to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realm by bringing glory to God through our redeemed way of life. And one of the ways we're supposed to do it is this passage that's still on the screen to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace so that there is one body. Here we are now, living in an age with a fractured church. Somehow, having, having to complete this mission that the church has given, the mission of the church hasn't gone away. Jesus doesn't have, has lowered his expectations for, for how we can represent his glory in the world just because there are six different churches in Brooklyn, Iowa. Here we live in an age where there is division and we, we can't practice the unity that would be ideal for the body of Christ. So what are we going to do? What is our job as Christians and believers here as we sit here this morning to show God's glory through the world? Well, first, I think we need to practice unity. We need to embody the words of this text in Ephesians 4 by being completely humble and gentle, being patient, bearing with one another in love. And the place where that starts is going to be with each other in this room. Okay? If we here, just as a singular congregation, one of the six churches in Brooklyn, Iowa, can't experience peace with each other and can't show the kind of merciful and forbearing love that allows us to worship together and encourage one another in our faith without division and without resentment, then what chance do we stand of uniting a global church? None. If you want to give glory to God through the way that you live, it's going to start with treating your fellow believers in this room with mercy and love and forgiveness and restoration. 
that's what will bring glory to God. That's how the world, how the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms even will see God's glory is by the way that we do that for each other. And once we, when we've done that, when we've made that the aim and, and the goal of our hearts, then we can start to look out and start to treat other believers from other churches with this same kind of forbearing love, the same kind of patience, the same kind of gentleness. Because no matter how many different buildings or how many different names are, is represented by the church in, in Brooklyn or in Powsheet County or across the United States, this is the truth. There is one body and one spirit. There is one hope, one faith, one baptism, one Lord, one God, the Father and all, who is over all and through all and in all. And every single believer, whether they be a Catholic or a Methodist or a Protestant, is your brother or sister in Christ. And we need to practice fidelity with them. We need to, to walk in our faith together with them, to encourage their faith, to encourage the growth and well-being of their congregation so that we can give glory to God. Not to ourselves, not to the name of our church, but to the glory of our God and his son, Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and King. That is our job now in 2023 in a world with a fractured church to, to treat each other with love and grace so that we can bring glory to God and that the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms will know the wisdom of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I pray for our unity in this room. God, as we try to, to do this task that you have given us of representing your kingdom, uh, of completing your mission in the world, God, I ask that you would just give us a spirit of graciousness and love, forgiveness and mercy towards each other. God, help us to lay down our arguments and our pretensions and our hesitations about each other so that we can be unified in the church. God, we pray for our brother and sister congregations in Brooklyn and in Powhatan County. God, I just ask that you will bless them. God, I ask that you will send people through their doors so that they can hear the gospel and respond in faith. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that the church across the world will give testimony to your name by loving each other, that you will give us a spirit of graciousness and mercy and restoration so that we can show the world who you are. God, we pray these things in your name. Amen.